So I work with the largest global retailers in five channels, uh, food, drug, mass merchandise, warehouse club, and really what we'll call small footprint, but that includes convenience stores and value channel stores. So I work with the, you know, you would recognize the brand names of those folks that we work with. Um, the challenges they face are all really similar, even though they operate wildly differently, they have different audiences. Um, the challenges they face are, are, are really simple, and in my world we boil it down to two things, trips and comps. How can I get people to continue to come to my store at the same frequency they've been coming or more? And then how can I, thank goodness, when they come to the store, get them to buy more while they're here? So those, those are consistent problems and challenges for all of my retailers everywhere. You know, and I'll go ahead and state right up front that the, um, the, the retail apocalypse, I think, is pretty wildly overstated. Um, if you talk to friends in the banking industry, they'll tell you retail is a great place to be right now um, because people are shopping and spending more than ever. Um, it's really painful for people who have built a lot of buildings out of brick and mortar. That's tough, right? So, and if what's good for all of us as shoppers is we can shop from our couch or if we want to get in the car and go somewhere to shop, that's fine. We move much faster than people who build buildings, than people who drive trucks. Um, we as shoppers are really the challenge right now for most retailers who have legacy businesses. So that's the biggest challenge that I've seen them uh, come about with as a result of Amazon. But thankfully, what I'm, and I'm really kind of shocked at how quickly they've reacted to it, the best retailers, and believe me, there are some that aren't as good, the best retailers are being very nimble, which in retail is not a, it's not a common success factor in retail, right? It's being nimble and brick and mortar. So they've done very painful things culturally, very painful things financially. Um, you probably heard the headlines. Uh, we are shrinking our store base in the United States. That's a good thing. We had way too many square feet devoted to retail. So um, on the one hand, it's been really, really hard, and you know we all probably have friends that have been impacted by it in the retail business. On the other hand, it's absolutely healthy. Um, when we can serve the shopper at any time, however she wants to buy our products, we're all going to win. So Stratacash, and we serve the shopper in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different parts of the physical store and soon to be uh, outside the store, um, in those areas where you need to make shopping less complicated, less confusing, less time consuming, um, and frankly, just better for your experience. So um, I don't know if you want me to give some examples of that? Sure, of course. Um, so if you look at our retail media platform, which just seems awfully simple, right? I mean, TV's hanging in retail. Um, that actually is really important. And I'll use a good example, the pharmacy uh, department. If there's a, a TV screen in the pharmacy department, obviously we, you expect that most people are going to have their mobile phones with them. But if you're in the pharmacy and you're waiting on either a prescription to be filled or to talk to a pharmacist, that's a pretty stressful environment. Your mind is wrapped around health at that moment. You're probably worried for yourself or your friends or your family in some way. You're really open to learning about and frankly having some of the stress taken out by knowing that you're not alone and that you can learn more in this environment. That's a really, really tiny, simple example of how our platforms actually help people in that moment in shopping. Great question. So data, uh, the challenge with data is, of course, data can be its own product, and uh, there's an awful lot of folks in this building who are selling data as a product. The challenge that I see, you know, working with my friends in retail, is that they are constantly under pressure to actually move their headcount, at least keep it stable or move it down, right? So we're creating, by our nature as a technology uh, industry, uh, a fountain of data, right? And so on the one hand, that data can be great. It can lead to amazing insights. It can lead us to change our own behavior as a retailer in good ways. The flip side is we can create more data than a retailer could ever, ever use. So smart application of the output that data is, you know, it is, a, it is an outcome of something. It is not its own thing. So if we have, for instance, a shopper going to the wellness category, the over-the-counter category, and using an interactive screen where they're going from, I know I have a cough and cold, please just help me go from 300 items down to six items to make my choice, the two or three or four taps that they might have on an interactive screen, each one is a data marker. Each one times two million shoppers a day, for instance, um, are going to pr produce an extraordinary amount of learning. It's the application of that data that's going to make that experience better the next time the shopper comes in. So again, the output of data is, uh, and I go back to sort of what I said earlier, it has to serve one of two things or both if we can. It will make me want to come back more often as a shopper and more loyal to the store, or it will make me or help me buy more while I'm here. 
Yeah, so the state, I think the state of the industry is really healthy, you know, both on our retailer side and on the supplier side. Um, what I'm really kind of pleased at this year is I've heard nothing super buzzworthy. Um, and I'm actually thrilled about that, you know, because there's always something, right? The shiny, bright thing that, that everybody's talking about. And what I'm hearing this year, and I mean this is kind of shocking, um, are mature conversations about not just the tool and not just the location or the application, but the output. You know, how is that serving our business overall from everyone's perspective? Shopper, retailer, brand, shareholder, that's really important. So I've been really pleased um, to see that that's actually been, at least from you know, my experience here through this show, um, that it's been much more about uh, serving the entire ecosystem of retail because I think we've come through the scared part you know, where we're like, oh my God, our stores are going to have to close to, no, we're going to be fine. We're going to be different, but we're going to be fine. And how do we do that? You know, and I've known Stratocash a long time. Uh, <laughs> I've known them for 15 years or so. Um, and Stratocash, you know, our, as our, our heritage is software, it's delivery of, of massive amounts of data, sometimes just behind the walls that a shopper never sees. The difference today is um, we do the same thing, in fact, at a much greater volume than almost anyone does, but we do it in service of that shopper. So if you think, for instance, of digital menu boards at McDonald's or wherever, um, seems like a super simple application. That is not a simple thing to do. Um, hanging a screen is one thing, feeding a screen with 70 video elements that change based on day part, on the hour of the day, the day of the week, the time of the year, um, and to manage all that to an uptime so that no one's disappointed and sees a dark screen is extraordinarily challenging. So wrapping back to your question of how are we different now, thinking in terms of that whole ecosystem, keeping high volume data moving to stores, and also serving the shopper with high information needs in a really good way. So that's the, the biggest difference between our original um, uh, business foundation of delivering data uh, efficiently for retailers. Now it's delivering data efficiently to shoppers through retailers. Well, I would, I'd hope it's humility <laughs> is one of them. Um, you have to be humble in retail or you just you won't last. Um, and that humility tends to come from listening. Um, we all know that you know retailers, like everybody else, have to react to certain things. They react to shoppers changes. They react to shareholder requirements. You know, whatever it might be. Um, we, frankly, keep long-term conversations with all of our retailers. Um, you know, and I'll use myself as an example. I've been a Walmart supplier for 25 years, um, not at all in the same companies. But the consistency there has been both the shopper at retail at Walmart stores, my friends at, at Walmart who worked there and have, have gone through those changes. I would think that for Stratocash, one of the things that we show, one of our sort of, I think, defining characteristics is our ability to both understand where they are today, why that's different than yesterday, and where they're going tomorrow, and how we might you know, help them skate in front of that puck and to serve that shopper. So, you know, I say humility because it has to, it has to I think the culture of our company is quite humble when you, when you look at the sort of massive environment that we're in, but I'd call us a learning organization more than anything else. I mean, we learn constantly. Um, there's a proactive uh, amount of that, but more than anything else, I think we're aware of what's going on. And so when we walk into a chief merchant's office, a chief, mar chief marketer's office, we're not surprised by the challenge that they're up against. In fact, we've thought about it. We think about how our solutions might or might not he help, and then we help apply that and then offer it up. And then we're really, really fast. Um, retail is incredibly quick, even though most people would think it's not. Um, the things that we do, which are you know, on, some, on the one hand very tactile, you know, stringing cable and putting hanging screens and doing sort of very physical things. And then on the other hand, very, um, they have a lot of intellectual property attached to them. They all have to move at the speed of retail. And if you just look at uh, any of the businesses today, the retail businesses that are transferring from brick and mortar to brick and mortar and e-commerce, they are moving at that speed. That's really different for someone who works in store like we do. Uh, in the retail business, you'll hear a lot of people say, I serve the shopper. Well, when you serve, when you work through retailers to serve the shopper, you actually have three bosses. The shopper always is first. You know, if she or he is not receiving some amazing tangible benefit, saving time, saving money, being smarter, um, out of whatever it is that you're putting in your retail partner's environment, they're simply not going to react to it. It's going to fail. Likewise, we live in somebody else's house. Okay? We ha these stores aren't ours. These, are, these stores are owned by shareholders, by private individuals. We are really, really good guests, uh, and we work hard at that. It's, you know, it's not easy to do. I mean, the things that we do are difficult. They are certainly not things that retailers are good at. So we have to be really, really good at operating in their house. And what we mean by that is 
For instance, when we install a platform in a store, we'll do it when shoppers are the least present, if we can, so we don't bother the shopper. Likewise, retailers don't have any time or money to add new business processes. They've already got enough to handle, you know, with learning about e-commerce or whatever. So when we come in, and even though we offer a big change, whether if it's a, you know, thousands of stores placement of, of screens, the business process we take on as a managed service for them. That's really important. And then finally, for brands, and this is important, some of our networks are monetized. So, uh, and what I mean by that is that um, advertisers, brands that sell through those stores, will literally pay uh, advertising funds, media funds to be on those screens to be able to put their message, their brand message, at the shop, right at the shopper in the aisle. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Uh, retail media or digital place-based media is a business that we, at, and frankly PRN uh, um, founded it, and we've grown it over the last 17 years, but it still remains a fairly small portion of the overall media landscape. To be able to do that requires some skills that not a lot of other companies have, and in fact, I would I'd probably challenge anyone at retail right now to say they could uh, monetize screens better than PRN and Stratacash. Yeah, great question. Um, so in the past, I think our booth has been more about understanding what solutions Stratacash has. Um, you know, we are not a very aggressive marketing brand at this point, or have not been to date. Um, and that, there's really good reasons for that, even though we've grown exponentially over the years. Um, I think this year especially, what we're trying to, to help people understand, on the retail side especially, is what Stratacash is. You know, it is not one thing. It is a number of solutions that can operate across the spectrum of retail needs, from truly behind the walls, you know, delivery of mass amounts of data for an electronic learning platform, for instance, and we do that for a number of customers, all the way up to and including mobile interface with someone as they want a concierge experience in the store. So this is probably the first time that our friends in the retail business and certainly our friends in the supplier business have had a chance to see all of that combined in one place. You know, I've been here a couple of years, right? I mean, even though I've known Chris for years and years, and he's done some acquisitions over time, but we really ramped it up over the last two years. Um, we started with PRN, you know, a company that I was an early person uh, in helping that company grow, and it was just a great fit. You know, the technology that PRN uses to deliver monetized networks and shopper interfacing media networks is Stratacash's core backbone. So great fit, makes a ton of sense all the way around. The next acquisition was Scala, right? So Stratacash, our heritage is in massive data delivered at scale to thousands of locations, tens of thousands of locations. Scala is really, really good at a um, content management solution that can work from really one store up to maybe a thousand or two thousand endpoints, and that's a lot of retail. You know, a lot of things that, that let's face it, Stratacash and our basic software offerings might be too big for some retailers. We cover a lot more of the spectrum with Scala, and their their solution is really elegant. So it was a great fit and a great cultural fit because we all talk you know the same language of delivery of that uh, media to retailers. Um, following that, we took a look at a company called Lyft. It's actually a brand named Lyft. Uh, from another company that we ended up purchasing because we really, really strongly believe that small store format uh, is going to be a growth vehicle for the next decade. And the Lyft platform, which exists at checkout, you know, is there to sell you one more item as you check out. And unlike most screens at retail, which are about advertising or about you know, environmental changes in the store, this is pretty straightforward. If you bought a Diet Mountain Dew, would you like a pack of trail nuts? Well, there you go, we can get that for you. So it's really a simple platform when, when it's execution, but delivering that is exactly what we do. That's very complex to tie into a POS system, to integrate into a data system, and to deliver it at scale at a high level of service. So it made a ton of sense for us to get Lyft. Um, we looked then at um, the ID Click uh, company, which is a brand out of Belgium. Um, they are serving, and uh, pharmacy in Europe is quite different than it is in the United States. It's mostly independents, mostly mom and pops, and they had the same problem there. In a pharmacy environment, you have a high information need, a low information awareness on the part of the shopper, and frankly, it's a little stressful. Um, they found a way to build a, metail, a retail media network at Independent Pharmacy in Europe. We love that platform. We think it has a lot of synergy, and we're bringing that to the United States this year. last acquisition was Walkbase. Um, it's a technology company out of Finland. Um, when I was introduced to it, what was most exciting to me was the fact that the technology itself is so flexible. It is able to achieve something that over the last several years, you know, the whole retail ecosystem has been trying to find a way to interact with a shopper's device, their mobile device, in a basically non-threatening, non-creepy, um, you know, not, not necessarily even personal way. I mean, just a way that we can understand that they're there, 
start to learn from the behaviors of that device. If the shopper invites us in to interact with that device, great. We can personalize and get really concierge level with that. But even in the absence of that, we finally, without the gatekeepers of beacons or Bluetooth or some of these other you know, hurdles that we have to go through, WalkBasis allows us to actually monitor and understand every mobile interaction in our store, and we can use that to begin to do just what I said, drive trips and drive comps. Concierge service, right? When we think of that, I mean, and not a lot of us, let's face it, get concierge service in our daily lives. We just don't. Um, it's expensive usually. It's reserved for luxury items or luxury brands. And when you think of concierge service, the first question that a concierge asks is, what can I do to help you? Well, that literally is what we want to ask, but we want to do it in a really subtle way and at scale. So when we say a concierge service, it can mean that. It can mean a curated, customized, personalized experience for a shopper in any number of environments, not just the ones I operate in, but way beyond you know, sort of typical retail. Or it can be as simple as inviting someone back. That's what concierge do as well. You know, they will greet you when you come to the store, they will help you when you're there, and then they'll invite you back. That's what a concierge does. It's a face, you know, more of a, a personal way of interacting with a brand that might be known only as, as buildings with a brand name on it. Let's face it, in our generation, we've gone from having to go to a certain store because we had no alternatives to having almost more alternatives than we know what to do with, right? Just through a search button. A concierge allows us to help curate our own experiences to achieve them faster, to find them in the first place if, if we didn't even know what they were, and then to be satisfied in whatever shopping search or um, uh, retail experience that we're trying to achieve.